The topic is the way of salvation and the fruits of salvation. So how can we be saved and what are the fruits of salvation? So that people understand uh, if they are saved, they will have these fruits. Now we are not saved by doing good. We are not saved by doing good. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ who died for us on the cross. But when we are saved, because when we are saved, the Holy Spirit lives in us and we will be born again. And when we are born again, the Holy Spirit will bear fruit. And the fruit shows that we are alive. So this is very important that people understand the necessary fruits of salvation. When they are saved, they will have these fruits. Now first we want to talk about salvation. Now when people talk about salvation, a lot of people just talk about how we can be saved. But we want to first talk about what Jesus has done to accomplish salvation. It's very important to glorify God, to say what God has done, how much price He has paid in order to save us. So this is very important to understand what God has done in order to save us. Isaiah 53 verse 5 But He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on Him, and by His wounds we are healed. Jesus was pierced to, uh, now uh, down below is the explanation. So here He was pierced uh, on the cross for our transgressions, for our sins. He, he was crushed for our iniquities. He was crushed, He was put to death, He was punished for our iniquities. That punishment that brought us peace was on Him, that uh, He gave us peace, but it was His punishment that He was punished so that we can have peace. Peace, you know, uh, in Hebrew, Shalom would mean a complete person, complete soul, spirit, and body. So Jesus has died for us so that we can have a complete peace, the whole person including our spirit that have we have a living relationship with God and also our our soul will have peace with God and also we have uh, the, uh, the health of the body also that God can give us health when we trust in Jesus and have a close relationship with Him and by His wound we are healed so Jesus also healed us by His wounds on the cross so Jesus was pierced, He was crucified to pay for the penalties of our sins. Sins have a price of death. Sins have a price of death. When, uh, when we have sinned, uh, the penalty is death, is eternal death. But Jesus has paid for that because He has no sin. Therefore, His death has eternal value that He can cover all sins. So we need to really appreciate God. Thank you, Jesus that you are perfect and you are willing to come down from heaven and die for us on the cross and pay for all the penalties of the, of the punishment of sin so that we can be born again. So we thank you for that. And we should have gone to hell to be punished for our sins, but Jesus was punished for our, for our sins. And also by His stripes we are healed. We can have physical healing also. 2 Corinthians 5.21, this is a very important verse. For He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Now here, He is God. God made Jesus who knew no sin. Jesus knew no sin. He has never committed any sin. He has no relationship with any sin. The Bible, in the Bible, the word no means a close relationship. And that's why Jesus said to some people, I don't know you. But then he knows his sheep. And he has, so know his sheep meant he has a relationship with his sheep. And so he knew no sin. He has not committed any sin. And he became sin, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. So he became sin. So what does it mean that he became sin? That means he is purely holy, totally holy. Now his whole person became sin. His whole person became the representation of sin. All sin came upon him. 
everything that is called sin came upon him. He was the representation of all sin. So that's very wonderful that he has become sin for us so that we can have eternal life. This picture here, Jesus became sin on the cross. So here, Jesus has not committed any sin. God has made him become sin for us on the cross. That means he became the representation of all the sins in the world on the cross so that we can become the righteousness of God, that we have the righteousness of God upon us, that, that he's, He counted us righteous, that we are like Jesus, perfect, totally perfect in the sight of God because of Jesus Christ. So we don't have to fear and worry. When we trust in Jesus Christ, we became like Jesus, to have the righteousness of Jesus, that we not only are we forgiven, but He covers us with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Galatians 3.13 Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So here, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. That there is a curse of the law because when people have sinned, the law requires people to be perfect. And if people have sinned, the law will accuse people. The law will accuse people. So Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law that we are not cursed anymore. That He has become a curse for us. So He Himself, His whole person became a representation of curse. All the curses upon Him. So I hope that we believe that He has taken away the curses so we don't have to be afraid of any curse, including generation curse. Many people are afraid of generation curses. But when we trust in Jesus as our Savior, when we love Him and have a close relationship with Him and don't let sin stay in our heart, when we have any sin, we ask God to forgive us and, and overcome the sins by, with the help of God, then God, you know, God is happy to stay, uh, stay in us and Satan has no foothold in our life. But if we sin, then Satan has a foothold in our life that he will take over our life and he can accuse us and he can bring curses. But if we trust in Jesus as our Savior, Satan has no way to curse us anymore. Now some people said that in the Old Testament it says that God will chase up the people from the father to the third generation. Uh, and then they said that this is curse. First, the passage doesn't say curse. And secondly, in, Deut uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, it talks about that uh, Moses blessing the people and then say that if you obey everything God has taught us, then He will bless us. So the Bible does tell us that when we obey God, He will bless us. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, when we love God, He will prepare for us what eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, and the human mind cannot think of. So when we love God, He will prepare for us all these things. There is no more curse. So this is not a correct interpretation of the Bible. Now if people have sinned and they don't repent, and they don't turn away from the, from the sins, then they can fall into the curse of Satan. But if we trust in Jesus as our Savior and obey Him and love Him and, and let Him guide our whole life, then there is no more curse. So the solution to curses are to uh, trust in Jesus' forgiveness and also obey God and not to let Satan have a foothold in our life. We don't have to be afraid of curses. And some people are afraid of curses and say they're afraid that the curses from their parents it will come upon us. There are different passages that tell us very clearly that when we obey God, He will bless us. Now, what, so what does that passage mean when that God will chase after the sin of people for, to the second and third generation? That is, if they don't f repent and they don't turn away from sin, then God will you know, uh, chase after uh, the, the children. But if they repent, and they trust in God for forgiveness and they obey God, then there is no more, uh, God will not chase after the sins of their father. Okay, so here 
Jesus became a curse for us on the cross, they mean, this means that he took all curses from God. Now, it's very interesting, this verse here in Old Testament, it says that curses everyone who hangs on a tree. So in Old, Old Testament, that, you know, if someone has committed serious sin, they will hang the person on a tree to say that this person has, has committed serious sin and has not repented and they will be cursed. It's very interesting that the Romans did not know the Bible and they chose a crucifixion which is using poles from a tree and Jesus was hanged there so he was cursed for us. Now before the Romans knew, the Romans did not know the Old Testament, they did not know that. Hanging on a tree means cursed, the person is cursed. And, but God prophesied that, prophesied that in the future the Savior will be hanged on a tree to take a, our curse. So this is very wonderful. I hope we all appreciate God and like God for what He has done for us. And when we really appreciate God and believe that He loves us, then we have no fear. I have seen many Christians have fear. They are, fe they are, f uh, they are afraid of God. They are afraid that God will chase after the sin. They are afraid of generation curses. They, they try to find different ways to avoid the curses. But the Bible tells us if we love God, we seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to us. So there is no more curse. The solution to curses are to trust in Jesus' forgiveness and obey Him and love Him. And if we fail in any sin, we ask God to forgive us and then God will forgive us and then we obey Him and trust Him, trust in Him, then God will take away all the curses. So we don't have to be afraid. Okay, and uh, he, he took all curses from God and because of our sins upon Himself, He became a, he became a curse. Then we are redeemed from all the curses of the law. We don't have to be afraid of generation curse. When we trust in Jesus and live a holy life, we don't have to be afraid of any kind of curse. Okay, and the penalty of sin, Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The price of our sins is eternal death in hell. is eternal death in hell. And when we trust in Jesus as our Savior, that the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So uh, we know that the wages of sin is death. So when we sin, we have to be very careful and repent. Now sins can include any ways that we reject God, that we disobey God, that we don't let God take control of our life, that we let sin and anger and frustration take over our life. Then we have to face the penalty of sin if we don't repent. So Christians be very careful to repent and turn away from the sins. It's not just repenting. Some people just say, oh forgive me, forgive me, and then they continue to sin. We have to say no to sin and whenever there are any sinful thought, we say no and say, Lord, these sins will destroy my life and give the devil a foothold. So we, I'm going to stop it right away when I have the sinful thought to hate someone, to dislike someone, to despise someone. Immediately, I repent of my sin and ask God to forgive me. And God is very happy to forgive us. But if Christians continue to sin, there is great danger. I have seen pastors who steal money from the church. And uh, I have warned that pastor. But the pastor did not listen to me. And uh, I'm very sad to see that. And I hope we all realize the penalty of sin is very heavy. Now, for me, I hope all Christians, we don't live in fear and say, oh, well, I'll go to heaven, or do I have to go to hell? We don't have to be afraid. We just trust in Jesus. Jesus will for sure forgive us. But when we have to honor God and respect God, the Bible talks about the fear of the Lord. It means to respect Him, not to be afraid, oh God, don't come close to me, but to be afraid of sinning against God. So when we, whenever we have any sin, we'll ask God to forgive us and cleanse us from all sins and give us uh, eternal life. God is very happy to forgive us. But if we don't repent of our sin and continue sin, it's very dangerous. Any sin can bring eternal damnation. 
Matthew 25 41 then he will also say to those on the left hand that's the, the goats depart from me you cursed into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels hell was prepared for Satan and his angels not prepared for people if people don't trust in Jesus as a savior they have to stay in hell forever it's terrible forever no way out there is no way out absolutely no way out so we don't want to fall in sin and we want to tell people we want to first tell people about the love of God the blessings of God you look at nature look at the food look at nature it's all created by God and our body is wonderful because it's all created by God and Jesus has died for our cross and the sin on a die for our sins on the cross so it's great love of him that he became sin for us and he became cursed for us so I hope you remember these two Bible verses that uh, we just talk about that that uh, for, uh, 2 Corinthians 5 21 that he became sin for us to be sin for us and then Galatians 3 13 that he became a curse for us so so then we don't have to be cursed and so we tell people that Jesus has died for us so that we don't become a that we are not cursed by God but if people don't accept this salvation they have, they go to hell so we realize we realize that there is a penalty for sin but we don't fear God in a sense that we're afraid of God oh God don't come to me that we f honor God fear God in a sense we don't want to sin to offend him and whenever we have any sin we can ask God to forgive us and we don't have to be afraid we don't have to be afraid of God we can rejoice in God and we can be sure of our salvation in Jesus Christ okay we are saved by grace through faith Ephesians 2 8 for it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not from yourselves it is the gift of God not by work so that no one can boast for we are God's handi handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do so let's look at these verses for it is by grace grace means and deserved blessings by the grace of God is we don't deserve this blessing from God we have been saved through faith so the way to be saved is through faith the way of faith salvation is not something we can be proud of we cannot be proud of our faith our faith is just like we are drowning someone saves us and reach out his hand to us we just reach out our hand and hold on to him faith is like that that we we say thank you for saving me and then we hold on to his hand that is that is the faith that means we receive the help of someone and here is receive the salvation of God so we are saved by grace through faith I use an illustration I hope you understand this uh, the faith now someone was about to drown and then someone saved him and he he was rescued and he went home he went to tell his family members I was almost drowned and someone saved me and it was fortunate that I was willing to take his hand and then I was saved now his family member would say why do you say you are, it's, it's fortunate that you reach out your hands I mean when he saved you it's fortunate that he reached out his hand to you it's not that you reach out your hand to him you reach out the hand to him it's natural it's the way to receive his blessings his help it's nothing to be proud of but many people are proud of the faith our faith has nothing to be proud of we should be proud of God's salvation Jesus Christ dying for us so I hope all the pastors here will realize that we are proud of Jesus salvation he died for us on the cross we're not proud of our faith now we thank God for our faith but our faith is not something to be proud of that we don't say wow it only because of my faith only because I believe therefore I receive it everything we receive salvation and the spiritual gifts and power spiritual power all is received through faith It's a gift a gift from God so we thank God for the gift we don't say oh I have this great faith we say thank God for the great gift and I just receive it with faith and God is happy to bless me so we understand that faith is just a way to receive the blessings of God so we 
we we are proud of God's blessings, but we don't have to say, "Wow, it's great that I believe." It's very important to distinguish this. Distinguish this. I hope you all remember that. So this is not from yourselves. It's not from our what we do. It is a gift of God, and not by works, not by what we do, so that no one can boast because. We can never be perfect. We, it's not by our works that we cannot boast and say, "I'm better than the other Christians," for we are God's handiwork. Now, this is very wonderful. And another version translated workmanship. So we are God's handiwork and workmanship. It's God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. So we are not saved by good works, but we're saved to do good works. So we understand this. The good works are the result of salvation. Good works are not the cause of salvation. We are not saved by good works. We are saved by grace through faith. And the grace of God、uh, will change us. He will change us so that we have, we can have good works to glorify Him, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So God has prepared. This wonderful good works for us to do, so we can glorify God. So we are saved to do good works. We are saved not by works. We are saved by grace through faith to do good works. And I use an illustration. If someone makes a car, he make the he makes the car to be able to carry people and go to places. He doesn't just make the car to sit there. So we are saved by God to do good. So this verse is very clear. We are saved by God to do good, and not to just sit there. And but we are not saved by the good works we do. We are saved by grace through faith, not from ourselves and not by works. God made us anew when He's saving us. When He saves us, He makes us a new person. He gives us the Holy Spirit. He created a new us to do good works. Good works are the fruits of salvation. So our good works are the result of salvation. That we are saved by grace through faith, and then saved to do good works. And then we are saved by grace through faith. How can we be saved? First John one nine. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So it's an unconditional blessing when we confess our sins. He's faithful. He's faithful. That means he'll keep his promises. He's keep his promises, and just. He's just because Jesus has already paid for the price of,、uh, the penalty of sin. Jesus has already paid for the penalty of sin. So he's just. That means fair. He's fair to forgive us because he has already paid for it. It's like. When we go to buy something, when we pay the price, then we can. It's just, it's fair for us to take the food back home. So Jesus has died for us. So it's just for Him to forgive us, and He's faithful, according to His promise. He has promised to forgive us when we trust in Him as our Savior, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, to clean away all the unrighteousness. God is faithful. When we confess our sin, He'll definitely forgive us. And Psalm fifty-one seventeen: The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. This, O God, you will not despise. Now, when we confess our sin, it's very important that we understand that we come to God with a contrite heart. Contrite heart means a heart of repentance. When we feel sorry and sad because of our sin, that is contrite. That we are. Really feeling feeling sorry. So when we repent and ask God to forgive us, we don't just ask God to forgive us. We say, "I'm sorry. I feel very bad about the sins. Please forgive us and wash us clean with the blood of Jesus, so I will have、uh, eternal life." And so we come to God with a contrite heart, with a broken spirit, that we are sorry for our sins. Ah, you try to try to try to try to, you know, man, go. 你挨埋個 pen， 挨埋個 pen， 挨落去，挨佢，你挨落去啦，挨落去啦，聽我話，然後掹撳佢，撳佢，然後向前，你要挨後先得噶，你挨後先得，挨後拱一拱佢，佢就向前。你你拱佢落去，拱佢落去，挨後嘅，你要挨後，放心，一挨後。
你一放心挨喉咧，佢就會彈翻轉頭噶啦。又整翻實佢。OK， I'm sorry、uh,。OK， and then Psalm 51 here is, talks about that. So when we have a broken and contrite heart, God will not despise. God will not、uh, look down upon us, but He will accept us. He will receive us. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Okay, we're saved by grace through faith. Luke 15:7. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. So if one person really repent, God will rejoice. The whole heaven will rejoice, because God is happy. Then the whole heaven will pick up the joy of the Lord. Can you imagine that one person repents? Then the whole heaven, all the angels, all the saints, together with God, will rejoice. And so we we want to say, Lord, I thank you, Lord, that when we repent, that you're so happy. So every time when we repent, God is very happy. So whenever we have sin, we say, I'm really sorry. I feel sorry for my sin. Please forgive me. And God is very happy to forgive us, and give us eternal life. Okay, John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. So the source of salvation is God loves us, but God loves us not just with His heart but with action. The action is so we have to distinguish. This is from the heart of God that He loves us. Then He has a plan to save us by sending Jesus Christ. To die on the cross, He gave His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. That whoever, so everyone who believes in Him, should not perish but have everlasting life. Then somebody might say, "Well, how about people who, who just believe superficially? They just say they believe, but they don't really trust in Jesus as the Savior." Now, if they don't trust in Jesus as the Savior, that is not real saving faith. Or if they Don't repent of the sin. Then it's not saving faith. So when anyone sincerely say, "I deserve eternal hell, but I trust in Jesus. I'm very sorry for my sin. Please forgive me." So have a heart of a contrite heart, feeling sorry for our sin. Then God will for sure forgive us and cleanse us from our sins. So this belief is not just believing in the head. Now some people say. Uh, this is a very, very wrong saying. Some people say, "Okay, some people just they are saved; they trust in Jesus as the Savior, but they are not born again." This cannot happen. When people are saved, they are born again. If people are saved, they say they believe in Jesus, but they don't repent of the sin, and they are not born again. They are not a new person. They don't have saving faith. When they have saving faith, it's like this: they say, "I'm very sorry for my sins." Please forgive my sins. Please wash me clean、uh, with the blood of Jesus. I'm sorry for my sins. I don't want to go to hell. I want to、uh, have a close relationship with you and have eternal life. And I want to glorify God. So he he's changed by God. He wants Jesus to forgive him. When he has this heart, then the Holy Spirit will come into him and transform him. When he has this real faith, so when we lead people to believe in Jesus, it's very important for us to tell them that we need to build up this、uh, trust in Jesus' salvation. That we need to trust in Jesus as the only way of salvation. It's like someone drowning; someone is saving him. He has to reach out and hold onto the hand. It's not just saying, "Okay, I will hold your hand." It's really taking action to hold on, to depend on the hand that saves him. So we depend on Jesus Christ as our Savior, depend on Him to forgive our sin. Then we for sure. Then this is saving faith, and a saving faith will bear fruit, will change a person. All real Christians will notice that from then on they feel sorry for their sins, even when no one tell them about the sin. They feel sorry for their sins, and they repent of the sins, and they want to change. It shows that they are born again. And they will bear fruit, and I will tell you later about the fruits that we will bear. And then John one twelve. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the、uh, children of God, to those who believe in his name. Now here it says received him, and believe to those who believe. So it tells us what believe means. Believe means receiving Jesus. Receiving Jesus is like this: you receive a guest. 
receive someone who will visit you. You let him come into your house. So we receive Jesus. We let him come into our life to be our Savior and as our Lord, as our Master. So when we let Jesus to come into our life as our Savior and as our Master, then we have the authority to become children of God. Romans 10.10 10, For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So when we believe in Jesus, we, with our heart that we believe, it's the heart that believes, and then we are justified. Justified means you are made righteous. You're called righteous in the sight of God. And then it is with our mouth that we profess your faith, you are saved. So when we confess, now, so here it talks about not just believing in the heart, but also we have action showing that we are saved. We want to be saved. So we say out, yes, I want to be saved. I want Jesus to forgive me. Then it's, that means faith having action. So the faith has action, has responding to God. So when, when, when anyone trusts in Jesus as the Savior, they respond to God. They will say, yes, Lord, they confess, profess the faith that I believe in Jesus as my Savior. Then they are saved. So when we believe, then we are justified, we are called righteous, that is declared righteous. When we profess our faith with our mouth, we are saved. So faith is not just with our heart, but also with our mouth and action. The, my mouth will say, yes, we want to be saved. Jesus is my Savior. Our faith from our heart will bear fruit externally. The fruit is that we will say, we will confess with our mouth and we will be saved from eternal damnation. Okay, the fruits of salvation. Now this is very important. That we understand every Christian who are saved will have these fruits. And I divided them into six fruits. And uh, this is all from the Bible. Any real Christian will have these six fruits. First, continue to repent of our sins and turn away from sin. Now here I put related to salvation because the first two is what we do when we are saved, when we repent and trust in Jesus as our Savior. But the fruit of salvation is that we continue to repent of sin and turn away from sins. It's not just saying I'm sorry for my sins, but we turn away from the sin and saying sins are destructive, so I don't want to sin anymore and continue to trust in Jesus as our Savior and Master, trust in Him as our Savior and Master, the Lord of our life. So this we continue to do. And then related to relationship with God, that we have a close relationship with God, that we are always in Him, and then He is in us. And then we love God with all our heart. Love God is the greatest commandment. So this related to re relationship, to have a close relationship with Him and love God. And then related to good works, number five is to s obey God especially the Great Commission, to tell the Gospel, and then to also help people to obey everything Jesus has taught us, and to serve God. Now some people say, I'm not a, a, a minister, but to serve God means glorifying God and blessing people in Jesus in daily life and in ministry. So whatever we do that will glorify God, uh, that then is serving God. Now some people say, how about people who are dying, and they confess Jesus. So, do they have any good works? I would say like this, anything that flows out from our spiritual life are good works. Anything that flows out. So when this person is saved, he will say, he will say yes, I want Jesus to be my Savior. He's born again. Then he will have this, uh, he say this. Sometimes he might not be able to even say it, but in the heart he say, yes Lord, I need you, I want you. Then he he has this desire from his life. That is the fruit of salvation, that he has this fruit. He wants Jesus. And sometimes people on a deathbed can respond more. But that's the minimum. When they really say, Lord, I need you. Lord, I want you. I, I, I thank you. I appreciate you. So these are the fruit of salvation. And every Christian, uh, the Bible verses I'm going to show you, show us that every Christian have to. These are necessary fruits. We're not saved by doing these six things, but when we are saved, we will do these 
six things. He will, will repent, continue to repent of our sins and turn away from the sin. If a person continues to, to sin and yell at people or steal money and they don't feel bad, then they are not born again. And continue to trust, trust in Jesus as Savior and Master. It's not just 10 years ago I believe in Jesus, but every day we trust in Jesus and let Jesus be our Lord. And then relate uh, to relationship, that He has a close relationship with God, that He's always in Him. So Jesus said, He who abides in me and I in Him, then He will bear fruit. So we abide in Jesus, have the relationship. Now if a person says he believes in Jesus but doesn't pray, doesn't respond to God, respond, uh, uh, talking to Him, guiding Him, talking to Him and guiding Him. That is uh, the relationship of God with us. And then we respond, then we are having the relationship with God. So we, it's like a personal relationship that we respond to the work of God. And then we love God. That's the greatest commandment that God has blessed us so, in so many ways that we appreciate God, we love God, we hold on to God, we like God. And if a Christian, a person says he's a Christian, but he doesn't like God, he doesn't appreciate God, he say, well, all this he should, have, he should do for me uh, is nothing great, then he's not appreciating God. So the, any real Christian will appreciate God. And then obey God, that he will obey what Jesus had taught us to do. If he doesn't obey God, then he cannot uh, inherit the kingdom of God. And then serve God is anything we do to glorify God. Any real Christian will tell people about Jesus. We live out this Christian life. Okay, now, so we look at these points. First, to repent of our sins and turn away from sins. 